with protocols have been being observed. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is an honor this evening to introduce to you the guest speaker for this evening, Dr. Kevin Greenish, the eighth governor of the Central Bank of Barbados, who is an alumni of the Adding School, like myself, and also he went on to Harrison College. He's the holder of a BSc in economics with first class honors, a master's in economics from the University of Cambridge, a PhD from the University of Nottingham, United Kingdom. The governor is also the holder of an associate degree in business management from the Columbia University. Dr. Greenwich's 25 years in economics spans that of econ economics, finance, public policy. He is a distinguished author of over 200 publications. He is also a member of the International Atlantic Economic Society, the Western Economic Association, a fellow of Cambridge Commonwealth Society. Governor Greenwich comes from a humble background and readily admits that he is a product of Barbados' free education system, which has been a catalyst for his personal and professional successes. Prior to assuming the role of governor, Dr. Greenwich was a senior economist at the International Monetary Fund for over a decade. During this time, when on secondment, he was a senior economic advisor to the Barbados government, where he, where he was instrumental in the design and implementation of the Barbados Economic Recovery and Transformation Program, BERT. As one of the architects of BERT, Dr. Greenwich regularly presents, explains, and promotes the program to the benefit of the average Barbadian. As a long-standing economist, Dr. Greenwich spent 17 years at the Central Bank of Barbados, where he was a director of the, where he was director of the bank's research and economic analysis department. Under his directorship, Dr. Greenwich emphasized the need to enhance the public's understanding of the nuts and bolts of the Barbados economy. But Dr. Greenwich was not just an economist. Dr. Greenwich was a national Barbados chess player. He's a, a ballroom dancer. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to invite you to help me in welcoming Dr. Greenwich to the stage to, to do his feature presentation. Honorable Colin Jordan, Minister of Labor, Social Security, and the Third Sector. Senator, the Honorable Lisa Cummings, Minister of Energy and Business Development. Senator, Dr. The Honorable Chantel Morrow Knight, Minister in the Prime Minister's Office, Responsibility for Culture. His Excellency, Mr. Wayne, McCock, Cook, Assistant Secretary General, Office of Trade Negotiations in CARICOM. Professor Sahiri Beckles, Vice Chancellor of the University of West Indies. Sir Paul Ottman, Chairman, Campus Council. Professor Clive Landis, Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal at UWI. Mrs. Julie Arthur, widow of late Professor the Right Honorable Owen Arthur, and members of the Arthur family. Dr. Jean Leon, President, CDB. Sir Trevor Carmichael, Senior Counsel. The Most Honorable Ralph Busy Williams. Professor Winston Moore, Deputy Principal, UWA. Professor Troy Laurie, Dean, Faculty of Social Science, UWA. Dr. Janice Remy, Dr. Director, Sharif Rampal Center. Members of the University Committee, Community, Representative of CARICOM, Representative of the Caribbean Development Bank, Representative of the Central Bank, Representative of Africa, Exempt Bank, Special Invited Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. 
good evening to you all. So a lot of words there. And thank you to Dion. He failed to tell that that's my baby brother. I thought I would let you know that. <laughs> but maybe he didn't want, just in case, after the lecture, he would then disclose that, depending on what happened here. But I also want, in that vein, to flag, and I was just speaking to Miss Arthur, that I have decided to board a googly this evening. Now, only she knows about it. <laughs> and that googly is that I have changed the title. <laughs> I'm not going to talk very much about the role of Central Bank and export exam banks, etc. I will touch upon them, but I've decided to change it. Why did I change my title? My, what I'm going to talk about. Because one, it took me for a really long time to read all the writings of when after that I can get my hands on and I read them all. Finished the two ago. And I only started to write my speech yesterday evening. I never write a speech anyhow, but I wrote one. So hopefully I can deliver with some zest to keep you alive. But then I was reflecting on a various conversation I've had with Prime Minister Owen Afra. Um, our most recent ones were while at the IMF. He would often call to get the latest information of what was happening as he tried to give advice and conjugal advice to the government. And his latest set of calls, he would always, his thoughts to me were on the sustainability of the economic development of the region thinking we have come so far with CARICOM. What can we do for her? Every time a shot hits us, it, like, we go back two steps. And I th this was his thinking. And I took some time, and I'm not, I forget I'm public, right? <laughs> I'm not trying to impress you, because nobody in my direct communications, the student central bank staff will tell you, I literally start yesterday, last night. Because I wanted to find something that was close to my heart, that I could, I could speak about, that I know will resonate with Owen Arthur, and along his thinking. And so I changed the topic. I didn't tell him in case I wouldn't get invited invite back. But then, as Sir Trevor Carmichael was presenting his piece, it kind of blended together, and I hopefully you will see um, where I come from as I try to put it out. And really, it's thoughts about how can we further deepen this process of integration and sustainable development. So I am really honored to be here just before you to deliver this third lecture of the SCR CDB Distinguished Owing After Memorial Lecture Series in this auspicious year marking CARICOM's 50th anniversary. And as we gather, as I said, celebrate and delve into the intellect of a story, the late Owen Seymour after a man whose unyielding advocacy for region integration left an indelible mark, engraving pathways of cooperation and solidarity. Again, I extend my heart Felt gratitude to the Sirius Rampal Center and the Caribbean Development Bank for this esteemed platform, preceded by esteemed speakers like Jean Leon and Dr. Carl Barnett. Tonight, I humbly contribute my voice to this evolving discourse on CARICOM's economic development. And my topic. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> we'll focus, I focus on a topic that has been the cornerstone of our collective endeavors and the electoral pursuits, that of attaining sustainable, economic, inclusive growth in the Caribbean region. The intellectual footprints of Oenafer underscore our conversation on sustainable, inclusive growth. His insights emanated not just from a profound acknowledgement, but from a fervent belief in the Caribbean's potential. He once proclaimed, and I quote him, 
the pursuit of national development requires more than just economic growth. And this is a statement that lights a pathway to a holistic and equitable process. For me, economic growth is therefore a dynamic force that holds the power to shape societies and transform lives. However, it is not an end in itself. It's a means to an end. Economic growth is a tool that can help us achieve our ultimate goal of sustainable development, which enhances the well-being and prosperity of our people. Our research analysis and our policy recommendations should be guided by this fundamental principle. We must ask ourselves, how can economic growth be harnessed to improve the quality of life of all members of our society over generations? In other words, how can we get economic growth that is sustainable and inclusive? And of course, as we forge ahead, our dialogue on growth is interwoven with complexities and nuances, and each thread contributing to a tapestry that mirrors our diverse and resi resilient interconnected region. And so what I will do tonight, or what we attempt to do, is to draw from the esteemed writings of Arthur and other collective insights from the region and present to you a narrative a region narrative grounded in sustainable and inclusive growth. To do this, I use meta-analysis and artificial intelligence to distill the key elements of sustainable economic growth from 5,576 different papers. Hopefully, the truth will come out. And with that, and those also include every piece of writing I could find on Owen Seymour Arthur. And with these insights, I will attempt to present to you and propose to you an economic framework, a model for sustainable growth tailored to Caribbean unique context. But before diving into these determinants, let me define again what I mean by sustainable economic growth in this context. It refers to an economic system that strives without depleting the, the natural resources on which it depends, while ensuring that social equity and meeting the needs of the future generations to come. It's a delicate balance that requires integrating social, environmental, and government factors into the economic development process. In other words, while well, economic growth lays that foundation, and I'm assuming that we, have it, we, we do get growth, sustainable, sustainable economic growth as the environmental layer on top of that, ensuring that the growth is environmentally friendly. And then sustainable, inclusive growth takes a step further by ensuring that this environmentally friendly growth is also equitable, reaching all segments of society and reducing inequalities. And so each concept builds on the previous, leading to this holistic, balanced, equal approach to development. And so what I will attempt to do is outline to you from that meta-analysis using AI, and there are about 300 different determinants of growth in the literature. I will show you 300, oh, sorry, just kidding. Eight of them, the ones that come out every single time that have shown to drive it. And then I will distill from that what I believe is a path forward, given that we have made gains already at the at CARICOM level. And so the first and top of all this is environmental sustainability in terms of a determinant. Every bit of the empirical evidence underscores the profound linkages between economic growth and economic uh, environmental well-being. 
effective resource utilization, waste reduction, investing in renewable energy, and the conservation of biodiversity are all foundational to sustainable long-run economic growth. In the Caribbean, with our pristine beaches, our rich marine ecosystems, and the vulnerability to climate change, this is not a strategy. It's survival. The second on the list is the quality of our institutions. Across all studies, transparent governance, effective rule of law, anti-corruption measures all stand out of pillars of sustainable growth. Institutions provide the framework within which economic activities can flourish. Yes, they guard the rights, ensure fair play, and foster an environment of trust, all essential for both domestic and foreign investment. Conversely, we institutions can hinder investment, hinder innovation, and retard economic diversification. So it's imperative for the reform of institutions to get in a, a sustainable growth. The third critical, most on top of the list, is the empowerment of people. We call it economics human capital development. Human capital representing the skills, the health, and the knowledge of our population emerged as a prime cornerstone for economic sustainability and growth. A healthy population, an educated population, a skilled population drives innovation, boosts productivity, and ensures adaptability in the face of change. From the classrooms in Kingston to the clinics in Bridgetown, our investment in our people is our investment in our future. Are you supposed to come? <laughs> yeah, <be a> cup. <laughs> In the, indeed, the research that I have seen, the research has shown that nations that invest in education, healthcare, and skill development have not just grown, they have ascended. Singapore, South Korea, Finland, they, those, they come to mind as exemplary nations that have ascended due to significant investment in human capital development. Singapore, for example, transformed itself from a small port city to a global Powerhouse attributed mainly to its world class education and healthcare systems with emphasis on skill adaptation and future, for future economies. South Korea, markets marked by its focus on technology and skill training, advanced healthcare, transformed itself from a war devastation area to a hosting a robust economy where you get global brands that we find in all our houses, including Samsung and these sort of things. Finland boasts one of the world's best education system and accessible to healthcare, enjoys a high living standard, and is often cited as the happiest country in the world. And these are just a few. And there confirms the importance of investing in human capital. The fourth one, a kind of silent one, is always productivity. Mm, the silent workhorse of economic development. Efficient production processes, technological adaptations, skills upgrade, all key. For the Caribbean, it means enhancing and leveraging technology. You've heard um, the extracts that Trevor Carmichael uh, would have mentioned. Um, and when after we've focused a lot on leveraging technology, Embracing innovation in agricultural and manufacturing processes and fostering a culture of continued learning and adaptation. The fifth one is technological innovation, embracing it. In this digital age, technology, 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 and innovation are the wings, the wing beneath our wings. Technology is not just about gadgets and apps, it's about transformative change, technological innovation and the adaptation of sustainable practice are key determinants in long-term sustainable and inclusive growth. The ability to upgrade and diversify our economies through adaptation of technologies not only boosts productivity, but it also fosters resilience to the changing global market dynamics. 
embracing green technologies and sustainable practices such as clean energy, waste management, and sustainable agriculture is essential for sustainable economic growth. I told you got eight, going to the sixth one now. And I call this, leave no one behind. An economy that benefits only the elite is built on shaky grounds. And you know what happens when something is built on shaky grounds. The empirical evidence suggests that addressing income in disparities, promoting gender inequality, and ensuring opportunities for all are, just not, are not just morally right, but economically askew. Our strength lies in our unity, in ensuring every Caribbean citizen share in the collective prosperity. And of course, the, last, the second last one in terms of those factors is a stable and vibrant financial system. Because we all know no economic modeling is complete without a robust financial system. The financial sector not only should play a, stab a stable role, provide stable finance, but it should be agile, innovative, and inclusive. It means mobilizing savings, effective allocating, allocating resources, and providing resilience against economic shock. And the eighth and last dominant factor is regional integration. And I can call this furthering our regional integration effort. Regional integration cooperation can play a vital role to unlocking that future potential of sustainable, inclusive growth in the Caribbean. We can leverage for the economies of scale, for reduced trade barriers, and develop signatories. Regional cooperation can also lead to increased trade flows, further knowledge transfer, and enhance our competitiveness. Yes, the Caribbean CSME has made significant strides in that direction, but I submit further efforts are needed to get the full benefits of regional integration. And no, so not having given you the distill from the, all the body of economic literature you could find on economic growth, and by the way, using AI, it didn't take very long, and this is the technology I'm talking about, less than an hour, trust me, 5,000, anyway. Now I can use those to craft what I would say is the economic model. I don't focus on one we are already gained. I won't focus on the ones we are taking. And in that regard, I won't present to you five pillars on which we can build sustainability going forward. And to do that, I acknowledge that we in the Caribbean face unique challenges, such as vulnerability to climate change, limited resource endowments, and a high dependency on tourism and foreign investment. Indeed, foreign reserves are a binding constraint. Therefore, a tailor-made economic model requires taking these into account and addressing them to ensure the sustainable growth. And so I present five channels, five pillars, in which I believe we can build on. The first pillar, the blue economy. Our seas are not just a source of beauty. They are a source of livelihood. The blue economy emphasizes sustainable use of the ocean resources for economic growth, improving livelihood, and job creation, while preserving the integrity, resilience, and the biodiversity of our marine ecosystem. The blue economy encompasses the diverse sectors that include sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, focusing on balancing economic growth and ecological preservation to combat overfishing and habitat destruction. It emphasizes harnessing the ocean energy, utilizing renewable energies like tidal, wave, and ocean thermal energy for enhanced energy security and climate change mitigation. Maritime sport transportation, sorry, is another pivotal sector with efforts centered on improving efficiency, safety, and environmental performance to reduce emissions and pollution. And lastly, but not least, the blue economy underscores the promotion of sustainable marine tourism that not only boosts economic growth, but also ensures the protection and conservation of our delicate marine ecosystem. We in the Caribbean, this region holds an abundant opportunity in my view within that blue 
economy framework. Our rich marine diversity, diversity offers prospects for bio prospecting aimed at the conservation and commercialization of marine generic resources, coastal marine ecosystem, including the mangroves, seagrass, the quarries, are all pivotal for carbon sequestration and climate resilience. In addition, there's an opportunity to harness innovative technologies to optimize the sustainable management and the conservation of our marine resources, ensuring both economical and environmental benefits to the Caribbean nation. And you will see that focus center and square in our BERT program is dealing with the blue economy. In fact, we have a, a ministry for the blue economy. Strategic implementation of the blue economy Caribbean entails developing comprehensive policies and regulatory framework that endorses sustainable practices, foster regional collaboration, and encourage international partnerships. You gotta invest in research and development. That is critical to broadening knowledge, spur investment, and applying technology in the sustainable utilization of marine resources. Additionally, raising public awareness and education regarding the value and the opportunities inherent in the blue economy is vital to galvanizing societal support, participation, and ensuring that the exploration of our marine resources remain both sustainable and beneficial. Regional and global collaboration is necessary to identify the impact of our blue economy in the Caribbean. Integrated coastal and ocean management approaches across the region to harmonize economic development in our ecological preservation. Cooperation among all Caribbean countries is necessary to manage this, uh, manage this shared marine resource effectively, mitigating common threats and maximizing economic opportunities. Also, international partnerships, enabling access to additional funding and technology and expertise to foster a robust global economy, sorry, blue economy that is both globally connected but locally relevant. The second pillar on which I build this economic model is a digital Caribbean. Now, the digital space offer boundless possibilities. In my view, the Caribbean must become digitally fluent. Establishing tech hubs, bolstering digital infrastructure, and promoting e-commerce can redefine our economic narrative. I'm talking about digital infrastructure development where we are investing in like high-speed broadband infrastructure for the provision of universal and affordable internet access for all and where we encourage the construction of regional data centers to ensure fast local access to digital services and encourage international tech businesses to see the Caribbean as a regional hub. I'm talking e-government services, where we streamline the delivery of public services, make it more efficient and accessible. For instance, online business registrations, e-visa applications, and digital tax filing can remit the bureaucracy bureaucratic processes, sorry, seem seamless. I'm talking digital education, training where we incorporate foundational digital skills in our educational curriculum, and where we partner with global tech giants, our universities to establish tech institutes and code boot camps. This can provide the young people with skills in areas of AI and data analytics and app development. I am talking digital health initiatives like telemedicine, which in my opinion is especially relevant for scattered geograph geography like the Caribbean space, as telemedicine can ensure that everyone has access to quality health care, irrespective of their location or their station. We should also seek to digitize health records, thereby streamlining medical services and ensuring timely health care. I am talking about promoting e-conference in a digital marketplace. Specifically, we should encourage the development of local e-commerce platforms to reduce reliance on international giants. This will keep capital within our region and cater more closely to local needs. We should also seek to strengthen and expand the digital payments 
solutions, from mobile wallets to online banking. This can also further boost e-commerce and reduce transportation costs, transaction costs. I am talking smart tourism, where we offer vital virtual tours of tourism spots, catering to this growing market that prefers exploring destinations digitally before they travel. How about digitizing the tourism services from digital checking at hotels to augmenting reality city tours? Let's use digital technology to enhance the tourist experience. I'm talking about building a remote work infrastructure, whereby with the global shift towards remote work, the Caribbean can position itself as a paradise for digital nomads, reliable internet, co-working spaces, and digital services to attract that global workforce. Like I said, the possibilities are endless when it comes to the digital space. But I will mention one last low-hanging fruit, and that is digitizing the arts and culture center. Sector. Two ideas immediately, immediately comes to mind. Online galleries and uh, where we promote Caribbean culture by digitizing and showcasing art, music, and literature on global platforms. And two, digitizing our festivals. I know we have some of that going, but taking it a step further, our various carnivals must have digital components, whereby broadening their reach. Ladies and gentlemen, the digital transformation is not a mere trend. It is our future. The Caribbean stands at an inflection point with the potential to harness the digital revolutionary's wings to sail across prosperity, inclusivity, and resilience. By investing in infrastructure, skills, and, uh, and innovation, we can ensure that our digital voyage is not just successful, but, assist, but is also distinctly Caribbean in flavor and in spirit. I move on to pillar three, the energy, green energy transition. The urgent need for green energy transition is a global imperative. And for regions of the Caribbean, it's not just a pathway to sustainable development, it is a crucial strategy for survival and resilience. Our unique drug, geography, our abundant natural resources, and our collective spirits offer us unparalleled opportunities to lead in this domain. Solar farms, wind turbines, and innovative solutions like we of energy can power our growth sustainable. The Caribbean region transition to green energy can be achieved, in my view, through a comprehensive approach involving, one, harnessing the power of solar, uh, harnessing solar power, which is solar farms, and promoting installation of solar panels, commercial and residential. Two, I'm sorry, so with that, and wind energy, so the wind farms are offshore, wind turbines and ocean energy. And two, implementing policy reforms and regulations such as incentivizing green energy adoption and introducing energy efficient standards. Three, building capacity and public awareness through education and training programs, as well as public awareness campaigns. Four, securing investment, vital investment and financing, including by using green bonds and collaborating with international agencies and other regional governments, and international also. And fifth, developing the appropriate infrastructure, including modernizing the electric grill, to make it compatible with the diverse renewable energy sources and efficient, ensuring efficient distribution and investing in battery storage technologies. And six, enhancing regional cooperation, ensuring resources, ensuring knowledge and innovation while harmonizing our policies to create a unified and efficient competitive market space. The fourth pillar is the RG revolution, RG cultural revolution. 
Our fertile lands hold untapped potential. Organic farming, farm to table movements, agro-tourism can rejuvenate our agricultural sector. In this blueprint of the economic sustainable model that I'm presenting, the synergy of modern technology and the ingrained traditional practices that we have in the region can forge a revolutionary path to sustainable and efficient farming. This is my belief. Precision farm agriculture, enabled by advances in artificial intelligence, is at the forefront of this thinking, transforming expansive fees into meticulously monitored ecosystems. Every planting, every irrigation, a harvesting step is optimized, ensuring maximum yield and resource efficiency. Biotechnology can instill resilience and abundance in our crops and dispel fears and apprehensions associated with generic modified foods and crops, not to mention the health issues. The prominence of organic farming and a holistic approach at agro agroecology assisted will assist in preserving the sanity of our soils and our ecosystems. Every farming practice must be a conscientious effort to bolster the biodiversity, ensuring that the land is not just cultivated, but nourished and cherished. Innovations in smart irrigation and efficient rainwater harvesting systems are not optional, they are integral ensuring judicious use and conservation of every drop of our precious water. I see a group. <laughs> Seriously, food security emerges as a rezoning theme in this agricultural narrative I'm presenting to you. The enhanced resilience and productivity resulting from technological and sustainable practices is directly correlated with increased food security. With this agricultural revolution, the Caribbean community is not just farming, but ensuring that every citizen, every community have unwavering access to nutritious, abundant, very food. Thus, food security is not a distant goal, it's an imminent achievement in this economic model. The fifth pillar that I present, and final pillar, is that of intensifying our regional collaboration. As we sail through this discourse, navigating the profound waters of this new economic sustainability model for the Caribbean, we arrive at a pivotal anchorage, that of intensifying the momentum of regional integration and cooperation. While the global jubilee of CARICOM marks our, marks our strides, the untapped terrains of possibility urge us to lead, not just with optimism, but with actionable, strategic, and concerted initiatives. CARICOM has delivered significant milestones, no doubt about that. It has ushered an era where free movement of goods, service, and skills is not an aspiration, but a living reality. A legal and institutional framework on the pains of collective actions, whilst functional cooperation amplifies our shared objectives. Trade bar barriers have receded, and in their place, avenue of brave, vibrant economic exchange have flourished. This, the integration is not inscribed in policy documents alone, but it echoes in the seamless exchange of goods and the uninhibited flow of skills and ideas across our beautiful islands. Yet, as we bask in these achievements, we are also awakened to the truth that the tapestry of our integration is intricate and evolving. The journey to deepen our regional Unity is akin to the continuous dance of our oceans, majestic yet unending. Our avenue to further intensify our integration lies in policy harmonization. Aligning our regulatory frameworks now, our tax policies, 
or business laws can further dismantle residual barriers, fostering an environment where trade and investment flourish, flourish on encumbered. Enhancing physical infrastructure and connectivity is also pivotal. Imagine a Caribbean where goods, people, and services move seamlessly, unbridled by logistical constraints. Enhancing our air, our sea, and our digital connectivity can catalyze this vision. We must also turn our gaze towards educational and cultural exchanges. The richness of the Caribbean isn't encapsulated economic, in economic figures alone, but res resonates profoundly in our diverse cultures, our traditions, and in our intellectual wealth. Establishing regional centers of excellence, promoting student exchange and faculty exchanges too, and forcing collaborative research can infuse vigor, fresh vigor, into our our intellectual and cultural landscape. The shared challenge of climate change beckons a shared response. Intensifying our environmental cooperation, investing in joint initiative for disaster risk reduction, and sharing technologies for climate resilience can ensure that our paradise isn't just economically robust but also environmentally resilient. In a world where innovation is the currency of progress, fostering a regional ecosystem of innovation where ideas are birthed, nurtured, and realized collectively can be our pathway to an economy that is not just growing, but evolving. And so, ladies and gentlemen, those are my five pillars on which I think we need to move forward as a region to get inclusive growth. So I turn my attention to the question closer to the title now, which is financing this, sustain this vision of sustainable economic and inclusive growth. It requires financial strategies that are both innovative and diversified. The approach of financing services as a bedrock for translating aspirations of prosperity and environmental balance into tangible outcomes is needed. Here are a few ideas. Public-private partnerships provide a practical avenue for blending the agility, the agility of the private sector with the skill and reach of the public sector. These collaborations are essential for launching projects which are both economically viable and beneficial to the society at large. On another front, we know there is a significant amount of liquidity surplus in the Caribbean financial system. Barbados, we got, we say we got three billion excess. And that presents both a challenge and an opportunity. The central banks, getting close to the time, <laughs> have a pivotal role to play in devising and executing strategies to channelize this abundant liquidity into investments that promote sustainable growth. Our focus, no, I didn't say their focus, our focus, central banks around the region, need to be on directing funds towards green initiatives, technological advances, and infrastructure projects that resonate with the regional sustainable objective. We must operate within those bonds. Another avenue, a green bonds and climate financing coupled with direct investment. Are avenues through which dedicated capital for environmentally and socially responsive projects can be accessed. The key is creating an ecosystem that attracts investment while, adhering, while ensuring adherence to the rigorous environmental and social standards we stand for. Technology and innovation funds are also another source of funding, ensuring that the Caribbean is not only attuned to the global technological advances, but also adapt at tailoring these innovations to meet our regional needs and aspirations. 
The integral landscape for international funding and collaboration is significantly enriched. And this is where I, we have to have more, an open mind, enriched with the inclusion of export import banks also, such as the African Export Import Bank, which recently set up shot here, and the Export Import Bank of China. These are now have emerged of, as cornerstone entities in our financial landscape. They are not just repositories of vast financial resources, but they are also epicenters of technical expertise and conduits for bilateral and multilateral trade and investment synergies. Africa Exec Bank, for example, with roots deeply embedded in foreign trade and economic development, has now extended its focus to the Caribbean nations with the establishment of an office here in Barbados and the provision of 1.5 billion to support sustainable development projects across the various sectors of the Caribbean nations. And of course, China Exxon Bank with an expansive global footprint continues to be instrumental in driving large substantial infrastructure development projects in the, in the region. And together these institutions they amplify the Caribbean access to a diverse array of financial instruments, trade opportunities, and international markets. The synergy between these banks and our Caribbean nations, in my view, promises to weave a narrative of economic resilience, diversified trade portfolios, collaborative innovations, position the Caribbean at the forefront of a sustainable integration process. Now, before I turn to my conclusion, I will I, let me, allow me to say a few words about the university here in stimulating the necessary thought and action to spur the type of social and uh, sustainable economic development model that I have proposed so far in this lecture. Let me start by commending SRC, SRC for this annual lecture series that provides us all with an opportunity to think as an academic community about the seminal role of economic policy in driving growth in our region. Much in a way that the Honorable Owen Simoafo would have wanted and embodied in his writings and approach to policy making. But beyond just lecture series, the region is also looking to UWI to create the necessary global action. And I, from what I can see, the, the university is delivering, especially on the sustainability agenda. The university recently announced at the SDG Summit in New York that's launching an international school for development justice that will help accelerate progress towards the SDG goals. I also welcome the work of, of the Sharif Rampal Center in stimulating a new paradigm for trade reform that is built on recognition that environmental, economic, and social progress towards the SDGs can only be achieved through an inclusive and a transparent approach. The center working with Yale and Tufts University is partaking in a remaking project that has released proposals to reform our multilateral agenda. Similarly, the Sajiko Kefil School of Business and Management, I put in a plug for you there, Dion. <laughs> known for fostering research and innovation, I'll make sure you have a job, you know, <laughs> is working on initiatives in and enhancing economic and social sustainability at both national and regional levels. In collaboration with the Barbados Private Sector Association, the school has developed the Barbados Business Environment Indicators Deposit Data Respiratory and Dashboard, a lot of more there, to measure and optimize the private sector performance and then align that, help align that with its SDG goals. I understand the school is also working with African partners, partners to enhance trade facilitation and infrastructure and to promote increased trade between West Africa, Brazil, and CARICOM, emphasizing green trade and the SDGs, and identify, identify opportunities to reduce barriers and investment in infrastructure. But I can't let the university do it alone. Got to steal piece of the action. And so the Central Bank of Barbados will help out to these efforts in a small way. 
in helping UE to become a beacon of regional development. I am pleased to announce that we, the Central Bank Barbados, we're working with the SRC and KFF campus to organize and digitize all the works and files of Prime Minister Owen Arthur so that they can be made available to researchers to draw inspiration from. And in the coming days, we will work on a plan to roll that out. The Owen Simon Arthur Library Center. In conclusion, I want to emphasize that we are not just passive witness to the transformation of food in the Caribbean. We are active participants, change makers, shaping our narrative. The goals of outline for, environment, for environmental sustainability, human capital development, tech innovation, and distance landmarks, they are stepping stones in our daily the journey. Every effort, every initiative brings this vision to life reflecting our unwielding, unwavering spirit and resilience. We stand, ladies and gentlemen, on the brink of unparalleled opportunities. Illuminated by the golden jubilee of CARICON and our strengthening ties with our African continent, our growth is tangible, felt in the lives of our people, the preservation of our environment, and the enrichment of our regional and global partnerships. We are not confined to the echoes of the past. Instead, we are scripting a dynamic future where prosperity, inclusivity, and resilience are not aspirations. They are our lived realities. Our reflections are not just abstract, but grounding in actionable insights. Owen Arthur's advocacy for functional cooperation is not a vintage of the past, but an enduring framework. As we venture into intricate dialogue on growth, Arthur words serve as both a compass and a catalyst. His belief that the future of all each is bounded up in the future of all encapsulates our journey of weaving individual progress into collective prosperity. Our engagement tonight is not a culmination, but a continuation. Each idea, insight, and aspiration contributes to a narrative enriched by diversity and solidarity. In the esteemed words of the Honorable Owen Arthur, in unity, there's not just strength, but an invincible resilience, a testament of our collective journey of crafting a Caribbean narrative where sustainability and inclusive growth is not a distant aspiration, but a living, evolving reality. I thank you. Dr. Greenwich, please don't leave the stage. Have a seat. There's going to be a moderated Q&A immediately afterwards. Thank you so much for those inspiring and uplifting words. And I will now invite to the stage Dr. Anki Scott-Joseph, lecturer in the Department of Economics, to moderate the Q&A. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Good evening. Allow me to adopt the protocols that have already been established. Dr. Gwenich, good evening to you. At this time, we will open for questioning. But before we do so, I want to pose a question that has been um, sent to us online. Dr. Gwenich, uh, you have outlined the five parts or the five factors model to help us to determine what would be necessary to deepen integration. The individual wants to know 
what role can the Exim Bank have to support and promote these five factors that you've mentioned? Thank you for the question. I would have mentioned it in the discourse. Not just Exim Bank, Africa Exim Bank, and, uh, China Exim Bank, but these institutions bring viable financial resource, first and foremost, because in their own rights, Afred Zinc Bank, for example, the focus of the 1.5 billion US is to fund projects that will go towards and help us achieve the green transition, energy efficient projects and things that, uh, the one of the problems we have in the region is that you need money to develop, you need money to, to do the things we need to do. And the money we need for economic development, especially building climate resilience and the green transition, is long-term financing, which is a physical experience that allows those projects to start to give back the economic returns you expect. And that's not what I would call economic sexy investment. That is where these institutions provide a space. They have insufficient backing, a balance sheet space that they can offer one, help finance those sort of projects. Two, collaborate with local banks, local institutions to help spread the risk and thereby further provide further uh, uh, financing. And so the primary goal of them is party financing. But they bring other expertise because Africa Exempt Banks, for example, now you have a connection to getting products because they're forced to export uh, facilitation. Now, you can, if you can get your products that you get, you have access to our connection, the African connection, you know, the African markets. So they provide more, for, more of a space within helping us develop. Maybe in Barbados, look at uh, China as um, financing of the Scotland district rules, a 20 year loan. Because that's going to take time. It's going to take time for the dividends there to return. So that's. In my view, the role it plays. It's not one of the five pillars, but it's more of the, if the five pillars are what is going to give you sustainable economic growth, this financing is, is the, the, the glue in between those pillars, holding it together to help us get where we need to go. Thanks, Dr. Greenwich. I'll now turn to the audience. If you do have a question, you can proceed now. Please stand. There's a microphone on your right. Good evening, Dr. Greenwich. Um, excellent lecture this evening. Thank you. Um, Thank you. I have a serious question about so. one of our pillars, uh, which was the renewable energy pillar. I see our Minister of Energy here, Lisa Cummings. Good evening, Ms. Cummings. And I see Mr. Williams here. Good evening, Mr. Williams. So, uh, I wanted to ask you, sir, uh, how realistic are our renewable energy goals as a country, and how come we are speaking renewable energy as a pillar for transitioning the Barbados economy onto growth? Uh, we've had the oil crisis in Ukraine, and we've had general oil crisis in terms of the price naturally ever so often in our economy. So how come we are still pursuing a policy of offshore drilling of oil and gas uh, in Barbados and the region if we are serious as a country and as a region in pursuing uh, renewable energy, as you mentioned, air, sea, uh, and any other kind of renewable energy that we could deploy to help transition our economy. Thank you, Kima. Dr. Greenwich. Thank you for the question. So <clears throat> why, why we continue to do it? Not only Barbados, the region. 
excuse me, you mentioned all prices, etc. I mean, that tells me that it's not a question of why, it's that you have to. The only way we can insulate or provide some sort of insulation against the viruses of the international market, particularly oil policy, et cetera, is to wean ourselves off of fossil fuel. So it made sense to use all the resources we have, naturally the sun, the wind, et cetera, to move into the renewable energy space, thereby helping to build economic resilience, et cetera. So it is a natural transition. On the question is why country will continue to drill, you ain't gonna get full renewable transition tomorrow, day after tomorrow. You still gotta eat, you still gotta survive. And therefore, while you're transitioning, look, this is the amount of natural uh, of oil, a fossil fuel you're importing. You may be here in terms of renewable energies. What we want to do is shift the balance over time. You're not gonna stop. It can't, it, it can't happen like that. But what is, hopefully is that over time, with the correct amount of financing and with the correct policy, and what I spoke about not wasn't individual, it was more thinking also about regional, integrated policies and sharing, and et cetera, we can shift, shift, shift that balance. And I think it's imperative, it's a, it, is, it gives you other avenues for which other industries will grow up, et cetera. So it, it, it makes perfect economic sense, but thank you for the question. The development of the capital market is key there. Mr. Williams, the front. Thank you very much. Hey, working? Dr. Greenwich, I was fortunate to meet you where my father and you were educated. And the reason I was there is because my father went to school there. So I felt necessary to give back to the school and, there, and, and we met. Now, the key to renewable energy is storage of electricity. Without storage, you, you can't do it. And there are various methods of storage. Batteries, or you could use hydraulic pump storage. There is an investigation that has been done by a prominent um, research engineering company in Canada which verifies that pump storage is a practical solution for Barbados. It is a hundred year old technology that, is, that can be amortized over 50 years. And I would like to meet with you to, to show you a model that I've created of, of uh, and it's all numbers. But the, possession, the, the thing is this, I find it unfair for the SIDS of the world to be going flat out to prevent carbon going into the atmosphere while the polluters of the, of the world are freely putting carbon into the atmosphere. So I have been trying to promote the idea of a small carbon tax worldwide, even in Barbados. If you want to drive a big stink pot, you pay a little more tax for, the, for emitting stuff. If we can just get a carbon tax worldwide that would pay for the purchase of carbon credits so that the small states like ours would be paid for the carbon that we don't put into the atmosphere because we we move to renewable energy. That would pay for the installation of pump storage and batteries over time. The, pro the thing with the pump storage, it has an advantage that it can be amortized over a very long period of time. You really don't know what's gonna happen with the battery. 
the battery thing might move very fast, but it not, it, it, the batteries don't last forever. So these are just ideas that, that I think we need to look at carefully. And um, I'd like to, to hear what your feelings are. And by the way, would you like to uh, give me a little appointment so I can come and go through the model with you? And number two, um, tonight I sat here and listened to our Minister of Labor, Mr. Jordan, who I have a great respect for. And then I listened to you give a speech. And the, the two of you all spoke about the story of my life. I would like you, sir, Mr. Uh, Minister, to come to help me launch the book that I have written on the history of Williams Industries on the, uh, the 28th of November. Because I want you to study the model, the Williams Industries business model, and see if you can promote it uh, across the, the, uh, the, the Caribbean. Right? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Williams. Um, We'll have that appointment set up. I'll allow Dr. Greenwich to respond, please. <clears throat> no, well, thank you, Mr. Williams, and, and I, I definitely remember we sitting together at, the, yeah. at my old Anamada school. What I would say is that normally, director of communications, my director of communications, I will reach out, well, I will reach out myself, but let's set up a, a time to have a, uh, well, I don't know if you drink coffee, but definitely a, a rum or whiskey, and we can <laughs> talk some ideas. <laughs> But I like the idea, I mean, the idea of a carbon tax, and I mean, there's a, you, you have to gather, it's a brilliant idea, I like I think it's been floated before. If you can gather enough says pushing it, I think it's something that, I mean, we are battling many on the, it can be folding as part of the whole drive to get reasonable climate financing for the ills that we have not produce, but we are suffering. I like the idea very much. And I think, so nobody let's set it up and have a conversation. Thank you. Um. Uh, Dr. Greenwich. Um. Yeah, just one, one more little comment. Uh, former Prime Minister, Professor Owen Arthur, was a very close friend of mine. He and I got on very well indeed. But I have never in my life been cursed so thoroughly as he cursed me once, when I suggested something that he thought would not be the best interest of Barbados. Don't worry, I'm not, I'm not going to curse you, though. I'm not Prime Minister. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Greenwich, in the, the first part of your delivery, you spoke about eight factors, and you mentioned human capital, the importance of human capital. However, in the five pillars, where does that fall, and what can the central bank do to promote levels of literacy which would allow especially entrepreneurs, very young and very dis disorganized entrepreneurs, to understand the importance of these various factors and how they can be used to capitalize on their productivity. <clears throat> so on, the, on one front, what I would have produced the eight most reference factors to get sustainable growth when I pulled the five, because the ones I didn't pull out We've already made quite a significant amount of progress along those. So I'm saying to go further, yes, we've got to continue to build our human capital, the university, etc. But how far, if you think of a, of, a, of a medium, of a distance that you have gained, we've gone quite far, but there's still more to go in human capital in terms of education, financial literacy, etc. But how much further are we from becoming digitally fluent? Much further. You can get, we get so much more miles gained just by stepping on the digital conveyor belt, so to speak, and moving. So I focus on the five that I think will give us a more bang for our buck and put us beyond where we are now significantly. What the central banks are doing, <clears throat> part of our mandate, and I probably can handle if you want to know thing, is to continue to provide educational services through literacy program, talking about the economy, et cetera, to teach, part. even within the green transition, what can you do, what's your part? Um, even a household, what can you do in terms of 
engines, conservation, etc. So we play, we have a huge part to play. As a product, we are just producing a, a series called uh, what's it called? <laughs> What it, what it means and why it matters. Starring yours truly, <laughs> three minute series on CBC every Tuesday night, right? At three, at eight, eight, eight. Advertising not allowed. Huh? Advertising not allowed. <laughs> I, I heard about this program. <laughs> but it's Central Bank of Barbados. And so that's part of our public awareness education program. I think we, has a part, we have a part to definitely play. I also team that with the, with the government in the ministry, um, and there's a financial industry program going and collaborating on that, even with Ministry of Energy, et cetera. So yes, it's important the continued development of a human capital, both in skills, education, et cetera. One more online question before we turn to the audience. Given the importance of the blue economy, why don't we have a ministry that addresses the, the issues as it relates to the blue economy. We do. <laughs> we do. We do. What's it called? The, 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 the Ministry of the Ministry of the Environment, National Education, and the Blue and Green Economy. We do. And I will say to you, many of the tenants in which I have spoken about have been weave, we have weaved them into the BERT program in one fashion and uh, the green transition, focus on the blue and green economy, green and blue hydrogen. It is in there. The Ministry of Transportation, can I, that's advertising? The, no, 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 no. Let's check it. <laughs> the individual says, um, this ministry has been reduced to activities that are similar to a departmental. I can't get in there. It's not for this audience. <laughs> okay, we'll turn to the audience. Um, Please allow your preamble to be very short so we can get in as many questions as possible. So, Go ahead, sir. No, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Governor, for the uh, broad uh, discussion that you've led us through. I'm interested in what technically would have been your sixth pillar, which is financing and mobilization of capital. You mentioned the role of Exim banks, but the two models you described are, are, are quite different. The China Exim Bank is linked to Chinese entities and their projection. And there is a solid business model that is arranged around that in terms of its projects that it undertakes and the benefits that are derived through, for example, infrastructure projects. What, what I would really want to ask you to turn your intellect to, uh, given the thrust of the discussion, is the mobilization of capital in the region and member states. And you mentioned, for example, the excess liquidity. And equally, you, may, you would perhaps have addressed the question of debt. Is there a model that you see in which we can reverse the paradigm in which the region tends to focus on highly debt-driven initiatives and the impact of that debt burden uh, of course, affects the ways in which we can advance the very important goals you mentioned. Uh, from where you sit, is there a way in which we can change the paradigm of uh, debt, finance, and investment in the region to drive the growth you proposed? Ooh. It's lecture number two. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Suffice to say, let me start from what you, the first part you said. So, yes, there's a lot of liquidity in the region. I believe the tune of, if it's about 50 billion, a lot of liquidity. We've got to find a way to mobilize that liquidity, whether it is by floating regional bonds tied to regional development projects and pay from that, from those projects with the returns on the bond. So cleverly designed paper bonds to mop up salad liquidity. And that's the challenge. How do we move this excess liquidity into these projects? Um, there's also a movement around the state, it says also championed particularly by Barbados, et cetera, via the Bridgetown Initiative to ask for a, ref a reform of the international financial architecture, whereby countries, says particularly this kind of region 
your only form of financing that you can find because, look, you always have to borrow to develop. The trick is to borrow at the right rate, the right duration to below. And if the only form of finance is, especially for climate, climate, building climate resilience, a high interest, then you're going to have a problem. And so the Bridgetown Initiative, and I, I know that's gathering momentum, um, asked for a relook at the international financial institutions, including IMF, the World Bank, and those sort of institutions, to, because, to help provide that kind of financing that is very much needed. And keep in mind, yes, the region have very high level of debt. But when you decompose that debt, a lot of it is not because, I would say, if we do a Bayesian term, what they're spending. A lot of that is because the region is highly vulnerable too. And always come under different shocks. And if you decompose it there, a lot of it comes mostly from the fact you have to keep constantly rebuilding. Right? And so it's almost a catch range. You've got to get debt, basically get spending debt to rebuild after a hurricane hit you or after a shock. Right? And that debt that you go to rebuild is expensive. And so that push out your debt. Right? And you soon shortly thereafter, a couple of years or you get another shot. So you got if we have to find a way to reform that kind of financing. Because you need the debt to build resilience, to build up the projects in the first place. And so that's the conversation that's being held at the international level where we need to find a way for low cost financing to build climate resilience and build infrastructure in countries like the Caribbean region. But, many, the, but even with the dimension, we can look at ways that we can float regional bonds. Why not float? And even within the individual countries, a person may not want to invest in a, say a solar farm or wind farm, but they might invest in a bond that is linked to that, right? So these clever ways in which I think the central banks and we have to start thinking about we're doing that. What's happening to the domestic market is very, very important. Kevin, what, sorry, Dr. Gwenich, what, what do you think is the possibility of we having a regional um, debt market where we can float bonds across the region? We have the regional government securities market, Guyana, Jamaica, Barbados. What do you think um, is needed to have a harmonization of all markets? I think we just have to do it. I mean, we just have to come together the region, decide that we're going to flow a bond in the region. I think to make it viable, though, it has to be linked to some large, some projects, some development, you know. Not necessarily for budget financing. But I think you would get that idea if you were linking it to development financing for a particular project at a regional level. Okay. And um, so it's quite... Possible. Possible. Thank yeah. you. We we'll now turn to the audience. Um, I'm sorry, this gentleman here, in front of you, Doctor Doctor Greenwich. Um, I'd like to understand your thoughts on the following: with the emergence of BRICS and their closer coll collaboration, whereby they're even considering. Um, creating another currency to challenge the US dollar, and also Barbados's closer alignment with China, do you ever foresee the Bayesian dollar will be delinked from the US dollar? <laughs> Good question. It was a s simple question, but most likely a complicated answer. Good question. <laughs> Thank you very much. I gotta make sure I got a job tomorrow, you know, I mean. Take my time on this one. <laughs> no, we at the Central Bank, would, um, and beside you is one of the directors on the board of the Central Bank, Justin, so he can be verified that we would do, we have conducted a number of scenario analysis and study this issue. My view is that this thing is a way, way off, long off, before the rise of the Brits could be, of a, in my, this is my view, a significant challenge to, to the vehicular nature of the US dollar. I, I don't think it'd be in my lifetime. Um, there may be opportunities for us to diversify in terms of our asset holdings, et cetera, as those, those currencies become stronger. 
but um, I see the dominance US dollar for some time out. I don't see a weakening it. And we would have done a number of analysis for looking, thinking about that issue at the Central Bank. And I, I, I can confidently say I don't think it's something that I would be concerned with. I would lose any sleep on at night. I might lose sleep on other things, but that's not one. <laughs> okay, we have time for two more questions. Dr. Greenwich. Sorry. Yeah. Good night, Dr. Greenwich. <laughs> and we will take your question. Please have a seat. Dr. Greenwich, it's so good to see you there um, from where we all came from. But in your presentation tonight, Dr. Greenwich, you spoke of the five pillars. And I would like to know if you can add a sixth pillar to this whole below of what you're presenting here tonight with health, diet, and nutrition. I mean, when we listen to the day-to-day -day increases that are coming over with the health and the, the, the Barbadian people who we are seeing to be losing them daily, I would like to know if we can go to the fact that a sixth pillar can be added to look at that particular area. Absolutely. In fact, when I, talk, when I spoke about empowering our people, the human capital development, is not only education, it's health and skill development. Health is very critical. So when I mention about Singapore and Finland, it's a three-piece index that people measure, and health is very critical. I can very much have added the human capital development, which is what you asked yes. me onto that, because we still have ways to go. And I think we're making strides, but yes, it could very much be part of it. A healthy population, you, you can't innovate and get ideas and be productive if you're not healthy. So it's absolutely critical. And so the concept of human capital is, is multifaceted. It is education, it is health, it is skill, and the whole gamut. So you're absolutely correct. Minister? Good evening, Dr. Greenwich. You partly addressed you know, one of the issues I was um, going to ask you about in terms of the need to restructure our global financial architecture in which we as small island developing states operate under. Of course, recently our political leadership has been forging links, Africa, Venezuela, China, deeper links, and uh, essentially the, the um, mantra of the right excellent Errol Barr, we're friends of all satellites of none. You have been a Washington, uh, don't want to say insider, but you have worked with the IMF for many years. Um, what do, we, how do you perceive our chances of being able to reform the global financial system that we've come and found as independent countries from 1948 post-World War, when we were not nations, and haven't essentially changed. I mean, the head of IMF is always a European, the head of the World Bank, an American. Um, and this obviously hinders our development as global citizens. What, what are our chances of being able to change and reform that system, in your opinion? Better than ever. Better than ever. <clears throat> we, you know, our, our um the political part, uh, directors. Let's give Prime Minister more. They have led the charge on this says trying to deal with the same issue you mentioned in trying to reform. And you're right, these institutions that exist before we were independent or before we were states. And now, but the charge has been to reform, to take into account our existence and the need to tailor our approach that takes into account our state of vulnerability just like any other country into the mix. And I say to you, the chance is better than ever. Look, one of the most significant reforms in the IMF recently added to the equation was the Resilience Trust Fund. That was really led by the advocacy of Prime Minister Motley, to tell the truth, whereby the IMF has now provided a facility 
that you can get financing to support a well-developed climate resilient building framework, climate resilient projects, 20 year money at 10 year, half year grace period. But building climate resilience and building out your infrastructure is not is a kink to, to you a personal level buying a home. And you're not going to get a mortgage for seven year mortgage in order to build a, a house. You want 25 year old money, but you would take a seven year mortgage to build a car, to buy a car, right? And so that now is the only game in Patong from that side, but that's a significant change since, I mean, when it was the IMF, when Ebola first came out, they brought out a, a facility to deal with Ebola. But it's been more significant change in town. And that, if IMF is now looking even more developmental than before, take the, the World Bank. Less than a year ago, the World Bank, the uh, president was questioning whether climate change even exists. Now we have a World Bank president that is looking, and the World Bank itself at developing a facility to deal and provide financing to address the issue of climate vulnerability and climate change. So the answer to your question is better than ever. <clears throat> this, and I think it is led by the Bridgetown Initiative. No, I know it's led by the Bridgetown Initiative. I'm getting more momentum, persons coming on board and realizing that as someone was saying earlier, I think uh, Billy Williams, that we, 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 are, we don't produce we are at the, uh, 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 at the receiving end of the climate change um, um, saga. So more than ever. Food for thought. Please proceed with your question. Thank you very much. Pleasant night each and everyone. Congratulations to you, Governor Dr. Greenwich. Thank you. On your position and your lecture today. I'm going to be brief. All that is being spoken of today speaks of money and the supply of money. The total money supply in Barbados as of October 2022 is $26.7 billion and five privately owned banks not owned by Barbados or Barbadians control 52% of that total money supply which you preside over, Governor. It brings me no joy in saying respectfully that in my view, your interests or mandate has nothing to do with the nation of Barbados and its banking Thank sector you, because, because we have no national bank. We do not own any banks. The interests or mandate, in my view, is reserved for private banks stationed in Barbados. So I would implore all Barbadians to recognize that Barbados needs its own national bank to capture. Um, so can you be very brief, please? To, yes, please. Thank you. To capture some of this money that is sorely needed to assist in the expenses of this nation. And I conclude. I am confident in Barbados and Barbadians that we can have our own national bank setting central banking policies for Barbados along with the other aspects of banking which would involve retail, development, financing, investment, etc. Thank you very much. Thank you. Governor? Yes. Um, well, I appreciate your comments, my friend. You seem a bit confused on the various elements of economic policy and banking. The money that circulates in Barbados economy is what underpins economic growth and development. Whether it is in a foreign bank or whether it is in a local, uh, national owned bank, it is in the Barbados banking system available to go into projects that it needs to go into. There's no distinction, okay? Simple economic concept, money is a function of economic activity. 
And the more you come active you get, the more money you need to support that. Right? And so I think there's a bit of a confusion there, but that's okay. The, the other question you mentioned was, um, I really find it hard to find it. It, no, 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 let's do Indigenous this. Don't, don't let's do this, don't let's do this. Indigenous Let me just banks. tell. The, the, the banking system, as I say, the funding banking system is what drives economic development. It is not owned by any bank. The bank, money in banking system, Barbadian dollars, et cetera, are issued by the central bank and provided for economic activity. That's how the economy works. It's called the velocity of money. It moves around to support money. Whether you take a $100 bill from a foreign bank to buy two packs of biscuits and a corned beef, or whether you take the money from a development bank and to buy two things of biscuits and a corned beef, makes no difference. The activity moves. You see what I'm saying? So that's not cloudy waters or that. Dr. Greenidge, I'm not clouding. I worked at three banks already. Thank you, so, sir. Pardon me, moderator, please, please. This is very important. Thank you, sir. Please. I please. worked at three banks already living in the United States in card services, very small, but the interest of banking caught me and I did my research. I understand the value of a national bank. We do not capture any of this money in terms of banking of that 52%. The private sector is not gonna fix our roads. They are not gonna look after our welfare. We need to capture money independently to do that. And having our own national bank is very important. Plus, we get to set the policies with respect to central banking. We can do it. Why are we being demon demonized like that? We can do it. And I would hope that when the advocacy for a national bank comes to the fore that you would not get in the way respectfully. Thank you, sir, for your you. comment. We have made significant strides as it relates to corresponding banking, and we have progressed when it comes to the risk. Governor, thank you very much. Audience, thank you very much. You want one more? Twenty minutes. Okay, we, uh, we are going to accommodate one more question before um, we close. Question on two, not, not, let's end on a more upbeat note. Please be very short with your preamble. Yes, yes please. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Greenwich. I want to address this question to you. I think you ended off by saying that we are on the brink of unparalleled opportunity. <laughs> I don't know if you be referred to be here in Barbados or we in Caricom. But, uh, and then what, in, in your point when you look at financing, you said that the financing was coming uh, for these five pillars, mainly, well, you mentioned the um, African exempt bank and the Chinese, right? And you also mentioned something called private, par private government private um, projects, right? PPP. But I want to know, I know you can't be blamed for the fact that uh, Barbadians who had uh, investments in the central bank uh, in terms of treasury, treasury bills and other investments got hammered. And I want to know, how are you going to recover the confidence of those Barbadians who were hammered by the central bank and get them to put money now into these projects? What are you going to do to get them confident to do that? Good question to end our night. Uh, so, to, yeah, yeah, yeah. First, so your question is, how do we do that? Well, yeah. the, you're referring to that restructuring. Yeah. Just on a, before I tell how we're going to do it, let me say that savings bonds and treasury bills, they were protected. They weren't restructured. But how are we going to get back the confidence? Your point is there would be a, there had been a loss of confidence following that restructuring. So how are we going to get by the confidence? One, we're going to reduce our debt levels significantly because when we engage in debt restructuring, they were at all-time high. And we have done that. Two, we are going to res restore the country's foreign reserves. One of the reasons, too, we had to engage in this whole economic recovery program is that 
At that point in time, we had no foreign reserves. Now we have three point something billion. We were going to make, at that point in time, the fiscal position was unsustainable. We were running deficits averaging 70%. We have now started to run primary surpluses, almost balanced budget, three. And the fourth one is that we had no growth. The economy has no, as you will see in the press conferences, we have, this, we have experienced our ninth quarter of growth. Those factors, strong economic growth, debt and fiscal sustainability, and reserve adequacy have already instilled confidence in investors and in the Barbadian public. So much so that, listen, who would know better than financial institutions and private financial institutions? So much so that financial institutions are picking up quickly all of the bonds, and the boss bonds is the most popular we have now, and, and investing in them. Four and a half percent, five years. But she said, <laughs> yes, and you may want to come and get some. The conditions, so the conference means that the conditions that exist at the time which light to the debt restructuring no longer exists, and in the foreseeable future, it's unlikely to come back in any hurry. We just, you know, in August this year, we got our third upgraded from a rating agency, Moody's. Yeah. Moody's, yeah, and then we engaged FITS um, this week, last week, and then we engaged S&P this week. And we've had a number of grades on our credit rating since then. So the confidence is about personally looking to invest in this country. In fact, I would, if this is the last thing I have to say, I would say, now is the time to invest in Barbados. Now is the time to sow that mustard seed. Whether you I will advocate leaving all your money in the bank, you gotta diversify your portfolio, but you should try to get some government paper, try to get some bonds, try to get some real assets, try to pay down your debt, that's investment too, and have some liquidity on hand for a short period in terms of cash in the bank. Now is the time to invest in solar energy, in renewable projects. Now is the time for two and three people to get together and farm, or four or five and farm a little conglomerate and buy some space and invest in, in energy products you will not find a richer time to invest in this country than in today. Now is not the time to be skitterish about investment. And I say that openly without fear of contradiction. And given what you see happening now, investing in the Barbados, investing in the region is the right time. Now is the time that you will earn dividends, significant dividends and return. Confidence is there, my friend. People are rushing to invest and be part of this. You, you just look around. And as a, as a Barbadian living here, you need to, we should step up and get the space because persons not in our shores are gonna come and invest too. So now is the time to invest. So that must see, my friend. The Central Bank of Barbados savings bonds, the original government security market bonds, the Guyana Jamaica bonds, they are all available. All of them are available. <laughs> all available. Thank right. you, Governor. Um, we, we have had a useful discussion on how to deepen integration, and Governor has identified environmental sustainability, the quality of the institutions, empowerment, productivity, and we thank you very much for being with us. Thank you very much for your questions, and I will now ask the Chair, moderator, thank to you. Thank you very much, Governor. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Scott Joseph. I'm going to ask Dr. Greenwich to remain on the stage and invite MITP alum, Ms. Bianca Merchant, to join us on stage where she will make a presentation to Dr. Greenwich. Thank you very much, Ms. Merchant and Dr. Greenwich. Yes, you can leave. <laughs> Thank, you. 
To deliver the closing remarks, I invite Professor Troy Lord, Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, to the podium. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I have the honor of providing a few closing remarks um, for this evening's proceedings. I think we can all agree that this was a most stimulating evening in various ways. Our appetites were sated and our thirsts were quenched by the very stimulating lecture by Dr. Greenwich. And, um, but I have to do this. I think the principal does this on behalf of the campus. Of course, I'm going to do it on behalf of my faculty. Now, as the deputy principal, Professor Moore mentioned, Dr. Greenwich is a product of the Department of Economics in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Caseville campus of the West Indies. Prof. Moore and I, we are both alumni of this same department and faculty. And I want to also say, I'm, I'm gonna follow the path led by Minister Jordan, and he was speaking about connections. He was speaking about the Aline and St. Peter connection. So, the faculty, um, Prof. Moore, Dr. Greenwich, and myself, we were all taught, we were all mentored by two founders of the faculty, the late Mr. Wendell McLean and the late Professor Sir Frank Aline. Incidentally, the late Professor Owen Arthur was also taught and mentored by these two gentlemen, the late Mr. Wendell McLean and Professor Sir Frank Aline. At the time, he was in the Faculty of Arts and General Studies, so at least you have a small break in the link, but I'm saying this because I really just want to and I want you to appreciate the academic legacy and lineage that brought Dr. Greenwich here before us today to present the third annual Memorial Owen Author Lecture. So as I sat here, because you're giving closing remarks, so you can't prepare these remarks before you come to the lecture. And the other thing is that you actually have to sit down and listen to everything that the lecturer says, right? So I'm here scribbling down a few remarks all the while. Everyone is just paying rapt attention. And you know, I have to do something I haven't done since I was an undergrad, which is to take notes. Students, they don't take notes. They just take pictures of what you have on the board, or they want recordings from your virtual lecture. Nonetheless, what we noticed from Dr. Greenwich is that he came here and he did not deliver a lecture on what was advertised. <laughs> <laughs> so if I had tried to prepare some notes, trying to anticipate what he would have said, I would have come here and I would have failed. But he came here, he said, he said that he bowled a googly. And I think the late Prime Minister would have appreciated that because he was a lover of cricket. <laughs> he bowled a googly. Instead of the lecture that you see here on the screen, he said he came here and he delivered a lecture on sustainable inclusive growth in the Caribbean. So he, to summarize some of what Dr. Greenwich spoke about, he first of all, and this is important, he said economic growth is, not, is a tool and not an end, and we appreciate this and we understand this. Even of course as economic growth is something that economists the world over, theoretical and applied, have pursued as an academic endeavor for centuries, this is still of course a conclusion that we would all be drawn to. So, Dr. Greenwich, he spoke of this distillation of determinants of sustainable economic growth from 5,500 odd papers, he said, in an hour by AI. You mean ChatGPT? No? Some other platform? You have to share. Nonetheless, he said this is distilled down to eight. Quickly run through a few of them. Environmental sustainability, the quality of our institutions, the empowerment of people, productivity, and so forth. A rising of this distillation of 300 factors that were identified from the literature, he proposed a framework for the Caribbean for sustainable economic growth. Five pillars, blue economy, a digital Caribbean, green energy transition, agricultural revolution, and an intensification of regional cooperation. So, I mean, for us persons that work in the discipline of economics, another economic model is certainly something that we are always seeing every month. So thank you, Kevin, for doing what we do every month, bringing another economic model for us to try to figure out. 
five pillars of sustainable economic growth in the Caribbean. Thank you. So I imagine you will eventually write this up and add it to the 5,500 odd papers that we can then have a student distill down to perhaps maybe even fewer economic factors. But thank you, the work is certainly appreciated. And then Dr. Greenwich went into financing, how we will finance such sustainable economic growth in the Caribbean. There were four main ways in which, um, four main ways that were identified. PPPs, trying to mobilize the excess liquidity in the banking system, green bonds and climate financing, and technology and innovation funds. So what we had in a nutshell this evening, ladies and gentlemen, was a real, and, and I know it's not necessarily something that you think about on a daily basis, but what you have here in reality is a real pathway for us to achieve some of the objectives that we wish to achieve as a region, certainly from a development perspective. It's not easy. I mean, I sat there and listened to a lot of what Dr. Green has said. Um, perhaps for you, some of it went in one ear and not the next. And I, we don't want to get the impression that this is going to be something that we can achieve in a month, in a year, five years, 10 years. But certainly what he's saying is that this is something that we have to start. And we have started um, to do some of these things. Um, it's very difficult. It certainly requires financing, which is kind of where he ended up when he was trying to circle back to what he was supposed to present on. <laughs> but nonetheless, we are thankful for what Dr. Greenwich has shared with us this evening. I hope that we have learned a lot. Um, I found the Q&A was also a very, very important um, dimension of this evening's proceedings. I think that it gave persons here in the audience and around the region the chance to really interrogate Dr. Greenwich's ideas. I think while his ideas are good, they do require further interrogation. We're not just to think that what he said is the be all and the end all, and Dr. Greenwich would agree. This is really what we would do in the Department of Economics. We would challenge everything. And I invite you to continue to challenge Dr. Greenwich on the framework that he's presented for us this evening. Um, but I say thank you, Dr. Greenwich, for an enlightened evening. So the final thing left for me to this evening is to basically thank uh, those who have made this evening's proceedings a success. So first, I want to thank the Caribbean Development Bank for their continued support of this lecture series. I want to thank the Central Bank of Barbados for helping to make this evening's proceedings a success. And of course, the Shreda Framfell Center for organizing this annual memorial lecture. I want to recognize Dr. Kian Skeet, who was pivotal in organizing this evening's proceedings. So congrats to Dr. Skeet. Well done. And all that I have to do now is to say good evening and to invite you to some refreshment outside in our foyer. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>